I wanted to start off actually uh, uh, because I know that you wrote a lot about Uzbekistan uh, mm -hmm. and Islam Karimov, the the authoritarian leader. I remember reading about him throwing people into vats of hot oil and God knows other ways that he tortured people, even though we we were okay with that when he was uh, <laughs> when he would ally himself with us in the war on terror. Um, but but I digress. You wrote a lot about what went on there about the Karimov and what do you call it? The country of the future or something of that nature is was the sort great of his future state. The great future state. That was his make America great again. I yes, would say. exactly. So uh, how about, you know, from your studies of Uzbekistan and Karimov passed away about two, three years ago. But under him, you know, what the comparison of what we're seeing with Donald Trump and in, in the ways that that he may have used cult of personality and media and the rest. Yeah. Um, back in March 2016, I wrote an article. Um, it was called Trump Minbashi, and it actually referred to the dictator, the former dictator of Turkmenistan, uh, Turk Minbashi, um, Saparmara Niyazov, who renamed himself Turk Minbashi because it means head of all the Turkmen. And so that kind of gives you insight into his megalomania. Huh. And then I also compared um, Trump to other Central Asian autocrats, including Islam Krimov of Uzbekistan, who you just mentioned, um, also um, Rahman, the uh, ruler of Tajikistan. And, you know, the reason I was bringing up Central Asia as a point of comparison was in part because of this cult of personality, um, the demagoguery. This is around the time that Trump had released that video of the little girls dancing and talking about making the state, you know, great through strength. And, you know, and it was right. just this incredibly, um, you know, post-Soviet kind of spectacle that I had seen so much um, studying in Central Asia, but was kind of, you know, unfamiliar to people here. So I was trying to put it in context. So there's that whole um, aspect of, you know, what Laura Adams is a sociologist who studies Central Asia calls the spectacular state, where you kind of try to mask your, your corruption um, and your cruelty behind spectacle. But the main thing, I think, that um, at that time abstractly tied Trump to all these countries is kleptocracy. Uh, it's the fact that the presidency is just viewed as a way to enhance personal wealth through setting up um, unsavory connections with quote unquote businessmen, um, you know, basically mafia or criminal figures, uh, stripping the country down for parts, stealing its resources. That's how Trump operated as a businessman for his entire life. It seemed obvious that that's what he would do um, if he got into power, and he did do that. Um, at that time, I didn't realize the connection to the former Soviet Union was so, uh, you know, immediate, and it's right. not like a metaphorical connection, but right. a literal <laughs> one. Um, but it's not particularly surprising that it is, because they have the same kind of values, and they have the same sorts of corrupt practices. And now he just has done, you know, the same thing he always did, but in the executive branch. Yeah. You know, and, and that's the thing I, I, I'll never forget. John and I both have studied foreign policy, both, uh, and, and have spent a lot of time abroad. And, you know, before you came on, we were talking about, I did some work, uh, through USIA through the state department and I'll never forget going to Romania, you know, and you still had in Bucharest in the main square, the bullet holes, they chose not to, you know, tear down the buildings and the building walls from when they had, had thrown out and executed the Ceausescu's. Um, and people still would, you know, I went to the northern part of the country near the Ukraine where people would still talk about, uh, you know, in, in sort of hushed tones, uh, how fascism had had uh, taken over, had run the state, had created this cult of personality. And, I, you know, it, it, I, a lot of what people had to say when I was there, uh, and this is over, you know, this is a decade and a half ago, was about the media, which not surprising, right? How, how the media became such a tool of the state. So I thought, you know, and I've seen you be critical, uh, which is, I think, how I first, you know, really discovered what you wrote, discovered when you were critical of the New York Times, which I've been incredibly to. But you actually, I'd like you to talk about, you went on Scarborough's show a couple weeks ago, and now he, of course, is a born again hater uh, of Donald Trump. But the role he played, you look, you spoke truth to power, quite frankly, um, and looked him in the yeah, face. I'm not sure I, I, they they picked up on that, but yeah. <laughs> so, uh, That's right. Well, we appreciate it. So I'd love, I'll, I'll shut up with my long question. I'd like you to talk about the, the Scarboroughs and the CNN and, and New York Times and your thoughts on the role that, that they've played and continue to play in this fiasco. 
Yeah, um, you know, I've been very disappointed in the media. I feel like the media was um, to a large part uh, one of the, you know, the primary reasons that Trump got into office. And I learned about this early because if you work in media, you know that financially this is a gutted industry. This is a vulnerable industry, and it's been that way for 15 years. Um, people will do anything for clicks, for cash, and Trump understands this. So there's this sort of mutually exploitative synergy that was always going on where he would pr provide profit and they would make him a demagogue. And I think they were in part so convinced he wouldn't win and that somehow this wouldn't matter, that this was a game they could play. And of course it matters. You know, he launched his campaign saying that Mexicans were rapists and murderers. It should have been shut down uh, and not encouraged or dismissed as a joke from day one. Um, but as time right. went on, it got even more disturbing because, well, I think initially the primary reason that these mainstream outlets boosted Trump was financial, um, was this cash incentive. Other things began to emerge that are more disturbing. And, you know, Scarborough's show, I think, is a good indication of, th of this. You don't just have greed um, and you don't just have complicity. You have threats. Trump threatened Joe and Mika uh, multiple times on social media. He threatened to reveal, you know, their secrets, you know, right. which we all basically knew that they right. were having an affair. Um, and briefly, uh, you know, the two hosts back in the summer of 2016 had gone through a little period where they were critical of Trump, and they immediately retracted that once he threatened them. They immediately began acting like his sycophants. And then once the information about their personal lives was out in the public, they became, uh, you know, to some degree, his enemies, or at least his critics, and they began to criticize him in a forthright manner after it was too late. And then you see this in other media outlets, too. You see CNN, where Jeff Ducker has a framed Trump tweet on the wall and plays such an important role in, you know, remaking Trump's image as part of The Apprentice. And they, you know, put these, um, you know, what they call surrogates on CNN, which are just basically professional propagandists and liars. People like oh, Corey Lewandowski, who was... Ever Jeffrey Lord? Working God. Yeah, Jeffrey Lord, who, you know, stayed there until he literally said seek hail and had to be fired for being a Nazi. Like, that's, that's what it took to get that guy off CNN. Um, and Corey Lewandowski, who, of course, was Trump's campaign manager yeah. and working as a CNN pundit. Um, you know, and you really, this idea that somehow Trump and the media hate each other is on one hand very false. You know, it's a, it's a mutually beneficial relationship that they've continued uh, to work, you know, in this capacity, uh, even though Trump as a leader is explicitly autocratic. And one of the ways that he's, you know, trying to boost his, autoc his autocratic practices and consolidate power is an actual attack on the press. You know, there are members of the press who he really targets. You know, I think April Ryan is a good example. If yeah. you're actually scrutinizing Trump, if you're actually challenging him, he really sincerely does want to silence you. And so there's on one hand these kind of fake feuds, and then on another hand there's a very serious threat uh, to freedom of speech, to freedom of the press, and I can't understand why members of the press keep encouraging Trump or excusing Trump or propping him up when it just digs their own grave. Because ultimately, you know, we all lose in the end. If, if one of us is silenced by this administration, eventually it will be the rest of us. And I wish that, uh, you know, these sort of access journalists understood that.